Welcome, welcome, welcome. This episode is my longest episode yet. I hope that you bear with me um, because it's a really good one. In this episode, we talk about all the things, everything from how do we know that a job is serving us or no longer serving us. And we talked about perspective and mental well-being and how our perspective is reality. Um, and we talked about the things that we can do to improve our mental well-being. So listen to the full episode or, you know, pause and come back. Here we go. Welcome to Impostrix Podcast, where we affirm the lived experiences of professionals of color who navigate imposter syndrome and racial toxicity at work. I'm your host, Whitney Knoxley, a Black mother to Black boy children, a civil rights attorney, and an anti-racism educator and trainer. If this is your first time listening, welcome. We're glad you're here. Episodes are published every week. Make sure you go back and listen to our past episodes. I am here with Dr. Ruth White. Ruth used to be my college teacher. She's a diversity trainer, stress management expert, and mental health activist. She's committed to creating a healthier and happier workplace, workforce, classrooms, and communities. This is my first time seeing her in more than a decade, so I'm super excited to have Ruth on today. And we are going to be talking about imposter syndrome, but also we're going to be talking about um, navigating and trying to figure out like what to do when we're in workplaces that we feel like might not be serving us. Um, so, Ruth, uh, can you tell us, first of all, hi. Hi, so good to be here. I just love when my students are just like rocking it and they're like, hey. Right. So, you know, I'm going to take like one teeny, teeny bit of credit out here, which is for all the amazing things that you do. But I'm really excited to be here to discuss some of this because um, what's really interesting is I have a client, a very big corporate client, and I did some work for them around stress management last year. And they asked me to do a customized um, talk on women in the workplace and women and their experiences of doing what is called like non-promotable work and also about women's mental health because of patriarchy. Because in this particular workforce, um, 70% of their employees are women, but only 30% of their leaders are women. So yeah, it's th these are some of the conversations that I end up having. What is non-promotable work? Because this is the first time that I'm hearing yeah. So that work is like what women will often do. So they will do things like uh, make sure that there's cookies and coffee. They will take the minutes of a meeting. Um, they will arrange the birthday, whatever, whatever. They might sit on some committee that is not, you know, so I used to tell like clients back in the day when <sighs> sometimes when I would talk to clients around this whole diversity stuff, I'd be like, if it's not part of people's promotable body of work, then people won't do it. It'll always fall on the bottom, right? So if it's not measured and if it's not rewarded, people ain't going to do it. Or the people that are going to do it are going to do it out of the goodness of their heart or um, because it's something they're interested in. So non-promotable work is work that people do that's not part of what is their job description that gives them the promotion or gives them the raise. I think it was a big study by Gallup. What they found was that it wasn't that men didn't want to do it, is that men knew that women would do it. So it defaulted to women. Um, and it's it's also just an extension of the role that women have at home, right? Where a lot of my women friends are like, well, if I don't do it, I'm like, okay, girl, so somebody didn't get the birthday card. Okay. Women at home do a lot of this work. And then it just extends into work place. So they're doing the same things at home and at work, making sure there's cookies or whatever, you know, or the brownies or the coffee, or it's, it's usually women. And I was thinking when you said that, like, this is it, it winds up being an extension of what we may do for, as women at home is this, it also sounds like an extension of what men do um, at home, you know, like, and that's how we're, we're socialized, at least in this society. Ruth and I were talking before about before we started recording just about the differences culturally, because Ruth is um, Jamaican and 
just has a very different perspective on things like imposter syndrome and belonging based on her cultural upbringing. And um, so I wonder if you might share some of that with us. Yeah. Okay. All you Jamaicans out there better not be, you know, getting mad at me. But what I realized was that culturally the way Jamaicans show up is always like, I'm here. Okay. Everybody we're here. We're in the room. What are we doing? Cause you know, I'm here. So, and it's, and, and they've replicated this Jamaican immigrants to England changed things about England because they showed up and they were like, Oh no, we're not doing that. <laughs> even though they're coming from the colony. They're like, no, we're not, we are not mm-hmm. taking fishing newspapers. Sorry, we're not doing that. Um, and I think also we have a lot of phrases in our culture that are about us being bigger than we are. So there's this one called we're little, but we talawa, which means that we're little, but we're big and strong. Um, Jamaican people say you're like coconut, you're in everything. Like we have all these phrases <laughs> that are like about, you know, just, being badassery. And at one point, Jamaica had, they were the number one country for women in leadership positions. And what's interesting is that it's a very macho culture as well. But like my mom's friends and some aunties, who used to say things like, oh yeah, you do whatever you want. You just make him think that he made the decision. Like they have had a way of being and doing as women leaders, doing literally what a lot of times what they felt like they picked up and they moved to, I mean, my aunties were going to England in 1961 and 60 on boats. And my aunt went to like Scotland to learn. I was like, before, you know, tele- like they just got, they were like, we out, we're going to go get educated and then we're going to come back. And then, yeah, you want to marry me? Just pause in a minute. We're co- we'll come back to you. You know, like mm. that, that is how culturally, like that's how I saw women navigate the world. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, it never, I never felt like wherever I showed up that I didn't belong there. You know what I mean? I just felt like there might not be somebody who looks like me there, but that doesn't mean that I don't belong there. And I think also because I grew up in a cult- culture that had black everything, what happens is you are, you, you feel normed. Like you don't feel somehow that you can't or this is different or whatever because you come from a place where you're represented. Let's just put it right. That. Yeah, yeah. As an as someone a black American, you know, like we don't even grow up thinking about Jamaicans or anybody else. You know, like our world centers around us. We are in the middle of our maps. You know, and so. It's just, I just can only imagine what it would be like to grow up in an environment where the air that I'm breathing is air that affirms me, where there's, I know that there's possibility for people that look like me, where that's the norm, where that's expected. And I will say that's generational as well. My parents used to sing a song that roll Britannia, Britannia roll the waves. Britain never, never shall be slaves. They sang that song. They were also like, my mom is, so my grandma is is half white. And so she had 14 kids of different complexions. And there was a point where like my mom's complexion, who's dark brown like me, she, like, you couldn't get certain secretarial jobs if you had a certain, even though you were in a black majority country. I also want to make that clear that generations changed. And like Michael Manley, who was a very fair skinned prime minister of Jamaica, affirmed the Africanness of Jamaica and, you know, tried to get rid of certain barriers that were around race. Like you can't go here or you can't go here. You can't play this unless you're a certain complexion. Like he kind of explicitly tried to get rid of a lot of that. So one of the things that I want to talk about is there are times in our life where we might feel like we need to leave a job. Um, Mm -hmm. And we might need to leave that job for any number of reasons. Um, Listening to you talk about these like non-promotable work. And I know one reason that I've felt for burnout in previous jobs is because I am taking on all of this non-promotable work, work that the company is saying they value, but it's not work that is part of my job description or, you know, can be part of my job description. It's not work that I'm getting credit for, like in the workplace. And when I, I have had opportunities to revisit my job description 
and to ask for some of the activities that I was doing that was considered non-promotable to be included in my job description. Um, in theory, it was so that I could make more time or at least have time for that. Mm -hmm. That didn't work out. I didn't, nobody took anything else off my plate so that I could do the things. I really encourage people before they take on some of these things, that's before you do it, have that conversation with your manager, have that conversation with the person who's running the committee. Because once you start, you're already in it now. So it's about us negotiating for it, like I would say, if this is what you say you value, then how do you show that you value this thing? Right. Right. Like people should be getting credit on their for their raises and their promotions if this is something your organization values. Right. Exactly. So how if I'm in a workplace or a listeners in a workplace and we are teetering on this edge of like, I don't know if I need to continue being here. How do I know if my workplace isn't serving me and if it's time for me to go? So I will say this is also generational. My okay. parents, they went to work because they had to go to work. Um, all my family that emigrated to different countries, there was no, this is not serving me, right? This is like, <laughs> I got to work because I got to pay bills and, and I want my kids to have a better opportunity and all of that stuff. And there wasn't this thing. Work wasn't supposed to serve you. Work was supposed to pay your bills, right? So I will say it's generational and I think it's it's a luxury, for a lot of people, depending on the kind of work you do and the kind of economic situation that you find yourself in, mm -hmm. I say when it's not serving you is when you don't want to get up to go to work. If you wake up every day just going, oh, my God, I don't want to be here. That's the first sign. Well, actually, it's one of the later signs. <laughs> I think it's always about finding the things that you like in your job. And focusing on those. And if you can outsource the stuff that you don't like, great. If you can't figure out a way to focus on the things that you love. Like, for example, anybody who's ever been in my class, y'all know I hate grading. But I love the teaching part. And I'm good at the teaching part, it turns out. And, and I'm actually good at grading. But I just, that's just the part of like the tedium of like editing and reading and just, mm -hmm. there's a lot of subjectivity to grading. I don't care about all the rubrics that people create, but I was not going to quit the job because I hated grading. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Because my job is as a teacher. Um, I wasn't necessarily going to quit the job because I don't like a certain kind of writing. To be honest, though, that was on my mind for a really long time because <laughs> that kind of writing was required of me. Okay. And it was something that I didn't particularly find was useful for what I wanted to do. Like the, mm -hmm. who I wanted to read my work, who I wanted to have the knowledge, et cetera. So I think f when the job is not serving you is when you find that there are more things you hate about the job than you like. When the reason that you took that job is no longer being served. So, you know, I think sometimes it's finding the piece of the work that you like and focusing on that will help you decide if this job is serving you anymore. And sometimes you're just tired because I, I want to also acknowledge that in the United States, there's no federal requirement for vacation. That's actually legal to give you no vacation. So in the United States, people often don't have sick leave and they don't have a lot of vacation. And so burnout is going to be more likely if you only get two weeks or three weeks vacation. If you're in Germany, you're getting six weeks. Okay. That's just vacation. And then you're going to get two, three weeks sick leave. Right. So that's a whole different way of working. And they have work limits. Like in France, my favorite people, because they don't like to work. <laughs> they have 35 hour work week, right? And they have laws now that your boss cannot email you after work hours. You work in a company of more than 50 people. Okay. Like they cannot email you. Mm -hmm. That's some work limits right there. Right. That's not... That's not, oh, I won't respond till tomorrow. They can't even send it out. So a lot of times we are burnt out and it's not really the job. It's just the way of living in the United States that says you must accumulate certain things. And those certain things are a house and a car minimum, right? That's a sign of accomplishment. Yeah. Owning a house is a sign of accomplishment, something I never wanted. There's all the things. There's the fridge and the stove and the appliances. Everything. 
and the roof and the door and the floor and whatever, right? And so when you have these things, they're a sign of your success. And the more grand these things are, the more grand the sign of success, right? I'm dri- driving the Beamer. I've got the three bedroom, two bathroom with the three car garage. That's what success looks like. And I think sometimes when we're talking about serving us, we have to remember that that's a script that you've been given. Yeah. And when you go against that script, as somebody who's, a, I guess people call me a free spirit or whatever. So I'm always asking why. My dad always said he created monsters when he told us to always ask why. Right. But I always ask like, why? Like I'm a, I'm a person by myself. Why would I need a three bedroom house? Like, what am I going to like, what for? And my friends be like, oh, you can make a room in your office. I'm like, but I'm by myself. I can use my kitchen table if I want. Cause it's just me. Like <laughs> I don't need an office. I don't you know. Like, what am I doing? Um, and so I think when we're thinking about what is serving us, I think what we have to focus on is what do I want my life to look like? Mm. That's how I know if it's serving me or not. Right. Cause if I am getting the things that I value, you know, if you value the never full LV bag and you want to spend $1,300 on that, well, being a lawyer serves that. Okay. <laughs> if that's what, if that's what it looks like for you, right. If red bottom mm. shoes and five star everything and flying business class is the life that you want and your job is paying for that life, then it's serving you. If what you want is more time, more freedom, more flexibility or whatever, then working a hundred hours a week is not serving. Right. And this is why um, there's a group um, called Exodus, um, E-X-O-D capital U-S. There's Exodus Summit, whatever. There's two black women. One of them was a lawyer who started it. And she went to Mexico, I think, and then just stayed there, Rashida Dow. And it's a group now. They just hit 10,000 women in their Facebook group. And it's a group of African-American women who are leaving the U.S., mostly because their life is not serving them. Right. Yeah. And it's very fascinating to see these women tell their stories and people trying to figure out, should I store my stuff? Am I selling it? Am I ever coming back? Am I not coming back? Am I coming back sometimes? Um and finding places to go that serves them, right? Like, okay, if I go, like, because sometimes, like, right now, my my mom is really sick in Jamaica. She's at the end of her life. She's 87. And so I had the flexibility, because I was the unemployed sister, to go and spend a lot of time there, take care of them, right? Um, so right now, not having, a just like, a permanent full-time job in some ways is serving me. Because if I had someplace I had to go every day, I would have had to take some kind of leave anyway if I wanted to do that, right? Um, And so, yeah, I think finding, and also if you have a lower overhead, then what serves you might be a lot different, right? Like I know people who are living in Mexico on $1,500 a month. So even as a consultant, that allows them a lot of freedom, (laughs) a lot of freedom in, you know, the pressure to get the next client is not about paying your mortgage. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I know it's, it's a long answer, but I, yeah, I no, I mean, I appreciate that because you brought up so many things and some things that, you know, I had a conversation just this morning about this idea of like, one, the privilege to be able to ask this question, like you said, like, is this, is this job still serving me, but how do we get people more in a financial or, other type of position to be able to have that flexibility and that freedom or that privilege, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. But But those choices we make, lifestyle creep is a thing. Right. Well, and to your point, it's like, okay, well, especially if this job is like harming me because I'm experiencing toxicity or because I, maybe I have personal stuff going on and dealing with the job is just going to take away from the energy that I have to give to the personal stuff. So, but this idea of like the lifestyle that we live and what I think I need versus what I actually need and what I'm willing to give up in order to not have to deal with whatever BS I feel like I'm dealing with at work. It just strikes me that at least from the privileged perspective, I found myself asking this question of like, do I have an out? Can I just leave? Like, can somebody in this position just leave? And if we think we can't just leave, then why? What are those things that are keeping us at this job? Is it the money? 
because then I, I can look at my budget. I can look at where my money is going. I can look at how to make it so that I only need $1,500 a month in Mexico versus, you know, $5,000 a month in Atlanta. And so it's just making me think about all of these different choices that we have um, that we can make different choices. Some of us can mm-hmm. make different choices. Uh, this is just such a timely conversation for me, particularly about like, you know, the life. Cause that's, you know, Jeffrey and I, my husband's we're getting older and it's like, I don't want to be looking forward to retirement. I want to be looking forward to tomorrow. Like, and Ooh, so girl. now that's a sermon right there. Right. And so like, how can I, what do we need to do? To make that happen. Like that's what much of my decision making these days is, is around like, what do we need to do to make it happen so that we're living the life that we want to live in retirement instead of waiting until we're 65, you know, 20 years later, but even in 20 years, still stressed out about money because now we're on like a real budget, you know? I have a 25 year old and I will say that that's one of the things I've resisted putting on her. Mm. she's indulging her creativity right now. Like she makes, uh, she takes old denim. She reworks stuff in an amazing way. Um, And I'd given her the sewing machine at six, you know, and she packed up her life and went to Montana. She was a California girl. She went to Montana. And if I had a penny, just a penny for every time somebody said, what's a black girl doing in Montana? I'd be rich right now because she was like, The same thing white people are doing in Montana. I snowshoe, I ski, I snowboard. I like being outside. I like hiking. And the thing is, I grew up that way. I took her on my back up in the Marin headlands and we would go into the bushes in Oakland and she would take naps in the bushes. I'd bring a blanket and put her down and I'd grade papers right there in the bushes up in the woods, the the Oakland Hills and stuff. And, And I also tell people midlife crises are made in your 20s because that's when you decide to to live a script that's not your own. And so I said to her, I said, girl, if you're struggling right now and you want to do your creativity, do it now because you don't have kids, you don't have a mortgage. And once you get those things, sewing cute stuff is not going to pay the bills. Um, And that said, being in Montana allowed her certain freedoms because her rent was like $700 or $800 a month. Was splitting with a roommate at one point. So her overhead was low enough that if she sold enough jeans on Poshmark, yeah. right, and gave blood or whatever, like she'd be okay. Yeah. Um, and she could grow her plants and she's out there trying to grow watermelon in a pot and telling people how to fertilize their cucumbers and crap. But you know what? I What I see is a happy girl, right? And she might not have a lot of money in the bank, but I see a happy girl mm-hmm. and a happy woman. I mean, mm-hmm. she's 25, so she's grown now. She's grown now. She grown. Um, but I see her, you know, trying to negotiate her life and finding a path that works for her. Um, but I think having these discussions, it's very important, especially for young women going to school and doing all the things and especially black women who are more educated than anybody else and who value that and value it for all kinds of reasons. So um, I do think that when we start to explore our options, we often see that we have more options than we think we have. Yeah. Um, and that we have more choices than we think we have. Because again, I think about my mom and her sisters and her brothers. And my dad got on a boat. It took him six weeks to get to England when he left Jamaica in 1961 or 62. And, you know, and these were, it, they didn't have any pictures that... Like when, like my aunt, when she was doing midwifery, I'm like, you just left Jamaica to go to this cold ass country. And like, you know what I mean? And so whenever I think of them, I go, okay, well, if they could do that, if they considered that an option before the internet and cheap phone calls and a letter would take three weeks to get back home and, and they did it because for them, that was a choice they wanted to make because there was a life they wanted on the other side of that. And so sometimes I think, that especially in the United States, we are bound by certain conventions of what life is and what life should be and what's a hard life versus, you know, the hashtag soft life right now, right? Um, And if we can just open our minds a little more and, again, decide for yourself, 
not based on the script written for everybody, what's important to you. I, I remember saying to a girlfriend of mine, I was like, the price of her never full bag was less than my three weeks in Costa Rica traveling the country. I mean, sorry, it was more. Like I did three weeks on $1,000 or 1100 bucks, something like that. And she, for her, she was like, I can't afford, like, girl, I don't know how you afford it. I'm like, you're literally wearing a trip right now. Your shoes is a trip. So again, it's just choices that people, black women and their hair. The amount of money I know some black women selling on their hair, I'm like, girl. Yeah, well, and like just beauty in general and yes. like these things that yes. there's nothing wrong with liking these things um, and treating ourselves to these things. But it does make me wonder then when like this morning I'm typing out an email to Ruth being like, or do I have a choice, you know, about the situation and wondering maybe I have more choices than I thought that I had. And it's a matter of recalibrating what my perspective is and mm-hmm. reconfiguring or like returning to my freedom dreams. Like, what are those? And not only professionally, um, but personally. And I think, again, to your point about midlife crises are made in your 20s. I'm somebody that decided to become a lawyer because I knew that I'm, I'm mission based. My mission is around advocacy and service for people of color and for low income folks. Um, mm-hmm. And that having a JD behind my name was going to give me more power. And that's an accurate <laughs> assumption. <laughs> right, right. And so that's, that's been my investment. But also then when, when that's the, the path that I take, how does that path affect my, my ultimate, you know, goals, my ultimate mm-hmm. dreams. Um, and the mental health part comes in there because during the pandemic, the interns at Goldman Sachs, one of the most de- demanding jobs you can get in finance, they rebelled and they were like, we're, we can't, it's just not sustainable. Now, of course, the old school people are like, we all did it, right? It's like, haze, it's almost like a hazing. Yeah. And they were like, mm, we don't want to do this. We're fried. We don't have time for our relationships. And I'm sure the older people were like, yeah, that's why we're divorced twice or so whatever, you know, and that's why we, we have lives that are separate from our families. Um, and then I think Goldman Sachs said, oh, yeah, people didn't have to work on Sundays. And then the joke was, yeah, they're going to work 24 hours on Saturdays. Right. I think that people's mental health was not being served ever by crazy work hours. People were stressed. This is why if it wasn't for businessmen with their banal sort of Um, desires, there wouldn't be a strip club industry. There wouldn't be expensive steak restaurants that are just for business. uh, And the amount of alcohol some of these people consume, the amount of cocaine and other things that Mm -hmm. support Mm -hmm. being awake for 27 hours or whatever. And so I like that there is a, that people are thinking, why am I doing this to myself? Mm -hmm. Is this is this worthy of my time and effort? Right. Um, and so mental well being, especially because we are, thank goodness, a lot of us fighting for destigmatization of, of mental illness and just having that conversation in the workplace about mental health, understanding that people want, they want more from life than to just grind and then sit on the front porch on your sofa watching TV or, you know, looking at the neighbors go by. Like people want more from their lives. And I think, you know, it's just another movement. People forget that there was a time when people worked seven days a week and five-year-olds would work in fields and they worked in factories and we fought against that. And the unions and all of that came about to say, oh, wait, we're only going to work 40 hours and we're going to get a lunch break. And, and I think, that was a significant movement and the whole quiet quitting, the whole like flexible work, you know, I, I just read an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about, you know, all the companies who like Google is still trying to figure out how to get people in and they're, they're like, yeah, mm, I'm not, mm, yeah, I'm not coming. <laughs> out. Yeah. Right. But yeah, I think it's really important that we're putting our mental health first and the pandemic has really done crap on people's mental health, although older people did really well. And that's because they built resilience over the years. They've gone through things. They know to come back. And the worst that suffered are the teenagers because they were at a time in their life where socialization and friends and all of that was really important. They didn't have it. And now they're all basket cases. Because of media and because of TikTok, because of all this stuff coming at people, it's more 
our mental health is more impacted by things that before sometimes we never really paid attention to, right? We didn't have a 24 hour news cycle. I mean, when I was little, TV started at like three in the afternoon or four in the afternoon, you'd watch the kids shows and then there'd be news at six and 11. And then by one o'clock, there was no screen. There was no nothing. You're just inundated with all the things. And one of the things I talk about in my stress management workshops is managing your media, mm. right? Like I don't watch news. Mm-hmm. I read news. I don't want to see the pictures. I don't want to see the visuals. I don't want to watch people get blown up. I don't want to watch people die. I don't want to see any of that. Nobody needs to see that. And if we can manage some of those things, then our life's choices and the way we experience our mental well-being is different because then we can pay attention to the things that we really want to pay attention to. That's what a lot of people don't do in life. They they forget to look at the sun going down. They, they don't notice. Like I yesterday I was walking and I saw these gorgeous roses and I was like, what am I smelling? And I literally put my nose to the to the flower, right? Being present and um when you were talking about living today, you know, for tomorrow, it's like also just living today. Be able to get out of some of the routine and see the wonder. And And I think sometimes that's what's happening when people feel burnt out. They don't see the wonder in life anymore. They don't see the excitement. They don't see the joy. They, they're just, they get up. Every day is the same. And every day is the same only because they're not noticing the difference in every day. And how do I appreciate life as I'm living it? I could be living in Darfur. I'm not. Even if I'm broke or whatever, and I'm going, okay, well, I have a place to live. I have people that love me. I have food. I can go for a walk right now and not have bombs fall on my head. And I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So our mental well-being also is not just about work. And sometimes our mental well-being is better when we can put work in its place. Yes. Yes. Where work is not who I am. Work is what I do. So I used to always look at work pays for the life I want. That's how I figured it. It, It's paying for the life I want. Uh, It was giving me the freedom that I wanted. And so when I would see it that way, I was like, okay, I can grade these papers, right? Because you know what? I'm in London right now hanging out with my friends before I teach. So we good, right? So again, putting work in its place. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen for you is that if you leave law, everybody's going to ask you why you left law. Right. And people are going to look at you like you're crazy and they're going to be like, girl, what? You went to law school. You did all of this and you don't want to be a lawyer and blah, blah, blah. And especially our identity as a lawyer or as a professor. I used to tell people, I don't care what's on my business card. I really don't. I don't. I care what's in my bank account. And I like when I was during the pandemic, I was bored and um, I'd gotten laid off at some point. But even before then, I took a job as uh, I was shopping for groceries at Whole Foods for people. And I remember two of my friends saw me like walking around the store and they're like, I know they were what they were thinking. I was like, yeah, I'm good. They're like, you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Because I wanted out the house. I was there by mm-hmm. myself. I mm-hmm. wanted to make money. I became a task rabbit person. I was filling boxes, even though I was still getting paid for my job because I got, you know, I got laid off, but I got paid for several months. But I realized how people just had so so much ego attached to certain yes. things. And I don't, I'm like, I don't, it's money. I, I don't. Um, and that's some of the, some of what we have to do when we're doing our mental health, mental well being check-ins, right. Where it's not about going on a retreat for a weekend once a year for your yoga thing, but how do you take care of yourself every day mentally mm-hmm. right, and spiritually Because that's the other thing. Like sometimes, especially people at work can suck your spirit. But I think mental well-being is about you choosing, regardless of what's happening around you, to be grounded and to take care of yourself. It's like we can decide our perspective on our lives. And that perspective is really reality. I tell people this all the time. Perspective is reality, right? Um. But the darker your perspective, actually, the less resilient you are for when those dark things do happen. So I want to say that when we're talking about work 
and workplace mental health. Yes, there are definitely things that workplaces can do to make better mental health. Within one week of me being at my last job, which was a tech job, I got them to change their meetings from one hour to 50 minutes. So people had a 10 minute break in between. Mm -hmm. Like that alone, people were like, wait, what? I'm like, yeah, you can actually set those defaults in Google. So it makes for 20 minute meetings, 50 minute meetings. So you're not running from one. So everybody's going, can I, I'll be right back. Because we have normal bodily functions. Plus we shouldn't be sitting for hours. Plus our brain doesn't work for hours. Like all these things that we know, we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so workplaces can do that. But also it's the perspective that we create about our work. The story we tell ourselves about who we are at work, the story we tell ourselves about who those other people are at work, right? How much of your mental space do you want somebody at work to take up? Do you just put a wall and go like, you know, I always say, be like Elsa, let it go, let it go, right? Oh, no, it's going to be stuck in my head. We'd all be happier people because we hold on to a lot of negative crap and the science, by the way, is that humans have a negative bias mm. and it takes four positive things to counteract one negative thing. That's just how our brains are. And I think the fight for a lot of us is to become more positive and not in a Pollyannish way where you ignore danger or risk or, you know, whatever, but in a way that says, what am I grateful for? And the more specific, by the way, the better in terms of our well-being. So it's one thing to say, I'm happy for my mom. It's a different thing to say, I'm happy when my mom makes me a cookie or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Flipping the script sometimes and going, okay, what am I grateful for? What is serving me versus what's not? And then highlight and do more of those things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much. And I was just thinking on your, your ending note there around gratitude and how like during various parts of my life, I have utilized gratitude lists like religiously and got very specific. And maybe I'm specific because I feel like today sucks and there's literally nothing that I can be grateful for except for that like the lights came on today. But sometimes, you know, my, my gratitude lists are very, very broad and um I'm in the recovery community. And so we, we talk about like gratitude being the opposite of like shame. Um, and so when we're experiencing shame to do a gratitude list as, as one of the tools to like help bring ourselves out of that. Um, what I've learned over the years is that my perspective does, it changes everything, you know, for me, for my internal how I show up in a space, mm -hmm. you know, is a hundred percent dependent on mm -hmm. my perspective. And if I'm showing up in a space that I perceive as being toxic or harmful for me, then I may feel that difficulty within that space much more acutely than I would if that was not my perception. So yeah. like, for example, I recently learned that like, there are people at my job who feel some kind of way about me. Before I learned that, I thought that my, the work environment was great, that I was like, feeling all myself and all authentic. And then I learned mm -hmm. that and now I'm like, that's a toxic environment, you know, but it's oh, the only thing that's changed is my knowledge of these things. Yes. Yes. And I always say to people, I give people space by how important they are to my life. Okay. So if you're not important, if you don't pay my bills and I'm not depending on you for my raise or whatever, I could give two Fs. In fact, I could give minus Two apps. Like I really don't because I feel like we should live our value, right? Like, so if I value freedom, then that's what I have. You just said something really powerful when you said the only difference is not now, you know, mm -hmm. and so you have decided then that because of what, you know, that the environment is toxic. But if you think about it, if it wasn't toxic before, why is it toxic now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And some people will tell me, yes, you know, people will wear you down. And yes. And sometimes we have more power than we think. I'll give an example. My friend, white, male, working in finance. And there was this person who used to come into work and just say nasty things about people, non-white people of various kinds and gay people. And I was just like, well, why are you putting up with this? Like, why is one person in this office creating all this? And I said, well, 
you know, you could report them. He's like, I don't want him to lose his job. And I'm like, why not? Okay. You have a zero because they had a zero tolerance at their job. So anyway, he eventually did go to HR. And when HR did their investigation, like 12 people complained about the same Mm. person. The guy person did not get fired, but they got to, you know, check yourself. And that changed the work environment. So, you know, and a lot of people are like, I don't want to be a rat. I'm like, whatever, man, you have to, again, decide what are my options? Do I have power over this person? If I don't, what do I have power over? You have power over your response. Mm -hmm. So Viktor Frankl was, he was a survivor of the Holocaust Mm -hmm. and a philosopher, psychologist. And he talks about this, about you have power in your response, right? So anything can happen to you, but it's how you respond. And human beings, it turns out, have like a baseline of of happiness or whatever. So it turns out like people who, for example, become quadriplegic through an accident. If they were very happy people, they go through a period of grief for their lives and depression and all that, but they come back to a set point where those are the people that are like, oh, let me go learn to ski in a wheelchair, right? Yeah. I'm going to go, like one of the guys I um, follow is a travel guy who uses a wheelchair. He found adaptive parasailing in Switzerland over the Alps. So he's in his wheelchair and some guy is, yes. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's, wheelchair oh. is attached and he's doing this. Corey is amazing. He's on Instagram. He's uh, all these places. And I, and I think about how many people would never do that period. Never mind do it when you have no control over your body, Right. But he has chosen to experience this life. There's another dude, and this one is African-American, and his friends, girl, I wish I had friends like this. His friends take him up mountains on their back. They throw him in pools and catch him so he doesn't drown. He lives this amazingly full life Mm -hmm. with no feeling from his neck down. Mm -hmm. And whenever I look at these people, what I get is inspiration and also just reminders of what your options really are. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Because 99% of people would probably tell this dude, parasailing, (laughs) what the hell are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Right. And so we, that's why I say sometimes we have more choices than we think we have. Mm -hmm. We have more power than we think we have. And most of all, we have power over ourselves. So we choose our mindset. We choose to be happy. Right. So I think again, some people say, well, I'm blaming, but I'm not blaming a victim. What I'm saying is even if victims choose how to perceive what has happened to them and how they use it, it can create a whole, um, me spending one week in a mental health facility changed my life. Cause I was like, I'm not going back. I'm going to live a life that makes me happy. And every choice has consequences. Mm-hmm. And you just have to make the choices with the consequences that you can live with. So sometimes we make decisions that don't serve us, but I always say most of us are doing the best that we can in any given moment. And that's why I give people grace because I think most of us, we're doing the best that we can. So you make that decision, but guess what? You can make another decision. Right. Like that doesn't have to be the end. Like that's not the end of it. That's not the end or the mistake even. Like if, if the decision that we're unhappy with is something that happened like that's all it is something that happened and now Mm -hmm. like I can make another decision yes Um, and I loved what you said about like choices and power because I think you know for me that's one of the reasons for having this podcast is to help people like identify in themselves their own power Um, because I think that we all inherently do have power and um, particularly folks of color who you know show up to these professional spaces and particularly in the United States, feeling less than, even though we're overqualified or more than qualified Mm -hmm. um, to be in those positions, you know, what I would love to see is just more of us able to stand in our power um, and and make choices from a place of acknowledgement of our power. I tell people it's all relative, right? As a professor, I have power. I show up in a classroom, I have power over what you learn and what all sorts of things. And sometimes we we only see one aspect of ourselves. So mm-hmm. for example, in the United States, race always trumps gender, for example, mm-hmm. right? And so people always talk about racism more than they talk about patriarchy, for example. And again, that's a perception 
of ourselves and how do we navigate the world and what do we what this what is the story we tell ourselves i remember one time i read something on linkedin where somebody was like i get up every morning and i look in the mirror and i see a brown face so i put on my armor and i and i'm like wait what like that's how you face the world every day where you feel like you got to put on armor girl all i got to do is maybe put on lipstick that's what i want to do and maybe a little gel on my hair like that's it right i'm not it, so once you once you have that right do you know what that does for your stomach and your brain and your blood pressure and your pulse and right? Like people forget that that perception is I'm going to battle, right? Your body says, I'm going to flood you with cortisol because you're going to battle. That cortisol holds on to fat. It holds on to sugars. It makes you want to eat more fat and it, it affects all these things. And especially in a chronic way, like it's not just stress and then it goes away. It's chronic stress. So some of the choices that we're making just in perception alone is impacting our mental health, but it's also impacting our physical well-being. Absolutely. That perception is really important because if you start from a place where I don't have power, I don't have control, the world is against me, all these things are happening. One is depression is going to be over you. And it's also never going to serve you unless you're literally in a war because you're not. You know, because I know I know women who have raised black sons to feel free. And I know women who've raised black sons to feel caged and they're both loving their kids. They just tell them different stories about what their lives can be and what their lives are. And it's those stories that tell you how to behave in the world. Yeah. And well, we what we've learned is that it doesn't matter whether we're showing up for battle or not, like what our experiences or how other people respond to us um, in situations that we don't have control over, like may not be impacted at all. I mean, like we can as driving while black, do all the things that we're told that we're supposed to do to show that we're not a threat. Um, And whether or not we do those things, there's another person who's also in this experience with us. Yes. For that too, like a lot of my friends hate when I say this, but no upper middle class person has been shot by the police. So there's a class factor that black people don't want to acknowledge a lot of times, or they don't acknowledge. And whenever I say this, people say, that's not true. And then I just wait. I said, I am here to learn. So bring me the first person who had the law degree that got shot. Bring me the first doctor who got shot. Bring me, they don't because police also know who has power. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm excuse my language, but they know who to F with. And yet I have friends who are, you know, su- their lives are so cushioned. They live in the sweet life. Um, and they still feel that fear. And I said, that's really interesting because that fear really doesn't apply to you. So your kids are really not at risk in the ways that you think they are, because look at the data, because the data tells you the story. And so for example, one time I did this U-turn And I was in my little buzzy space because that day I had worked with Serena Williams. I was a stand-in for a Gatorade ad with Serena. And I'd spent my whole day, me and Serena side by side. And I was like floating. Oh my goodness. So here comes, I was like, oh crap, what did I do? So I pull over and the police officer comes over and I'm like, I am so sorry. I just spent my day with (laughs) Serena Williams and I'm floating. And do you want to see the picture? And he's like, oh my goodness, blah, blah, blah. I got no ticket, right? (laughs) <laughs> my friends are like, that's just you. And I'm like, no, part of it is two scared people don't make for good interactions. Mm. And fear is something that we learn. Some things like, okay, I have a fear of heights. I don't know where I learned that. But fear is something we teach ourselves. And fear is something we teach our kids. Mm. Fear is something we teach our friends. I think fear, even a failure, fear of making the wrong decision, Fear holds us back from who we want to be and who we can be. And I'm not talking that you shouldn't have fear, right? Mm -hmm. But fear should be based on something real. And the odds of getting killed by the police are still really, 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 really tiny, right? It happens more for us than anybody, but it's still a tiny, tiny risk. Mm -hmm. And if we go out in the world thinking people are going to kill us, 
Think about how we're going to engage with people. Think about what our bodies are going through. Think about like, so, and that's why I say perspective is everything. Yeah. yeah. And so shifting that perspective, you know, my, my psychiatrist used to say, <laughs> I was the only depressed person she knew who would get up and go exercise. Cause I was like, I'm feeling crap, but I'm going to go do this. And she's like, you know, clinically that should not happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're like, not quite fitting in this you're picture. Not quite fitting, but I was always like, you know what? And I had this weird, I know it's a weird perception of a depressed person where I was like, I've gotten through depression before I'll get through this. Like, I'm not going to try and kill myself because I know I'm going to come out the other side. It's going to be okay. Right now I'm feeling crap. I know I'm feeling crap. It's kind of irrational because my life is good, but, and you know, and I'm intellectualizing an emotional experience. Right. I understand that. But what I always wanted to do in some ways was to be in control of my perspective. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to surrender to depression. Understanding that I had control over the way I perceived the world. Like that's everything to me. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's the key to your mental health and well-being is knowing that you can choose joy, right? That whole black joy is black resistance. Joy is, is something that you can choose in any given moment. For me, like dancing gives me joy. I will walk down the street bopping to my music. I don't care who sees me. That is my joy. And, you know, like me getting depressed over not getting the job that I want. It's okay to have those feelings for a minute, but drowning in them is not going to serve a purpose. But again, it's... Bob Marley was quoting somebody else when he said, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but yourself can free your mind. And I I love that because, yeah, you can be free up here no matter what's happening around you. Yeah, I actually, that's what I have tattooed on my chest because that right there. Yep. Because that quote, I mean, exactly. I don't even need to explain any more about it. It is in our perspective. And I can at any point be free of self-limiting beliefs and, you know, the bullshit, the bullshit that I put on myself. Like, yes, there's other there's other actors, Mm -hmm. um, but I also have a role in, in what happens with me. Like I have few things that I can control, but there are things that I can control. Um, oh goodness. Well, thank you. I'm going to end us there. Cause I, we could talk for hours. I really hope that you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Ruth White. You can find out more about her and her service offerings, including coaching and therapy at wellmindplus.com. This conversation seems to be really timely for me. As you know, if you follow me on social media, on Instagram, I just wrapped up my lawyering career for the time being. Um, And I am officially a full-time podcaster and entrepreneur. That is terrifying. But as I spent parts of this week editing this episode and reflecting on all that we discussed. It just really is validation for me that I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing right now. Um, And that is following my passions and going for what makes me happy and brings me joy. So I hope that you're doing that also. I would love to hear what, um, what you're up to, what changes are happening in your life shoot me a message on Instagram. Um, Feel free to send me an email. I want to know what y'all are up to. And that's a wrap on today's show. If you enjoyed the show today, I would love to hear from you. You can find all of my contact information and you can find ways to support the show directly on my website, www.imposterixpodcast.com. Until next time, be validated.